Are we all in order here now? We must have a quorum. Uh, we match everything. Everybody should be along. I think we're at 5 o'clock, so maybe we get started. We'll start with reviewing the agenda. Anyone uh, have any questions or comments or changes they'd like suggested to the agenda? If not, we'll move on. And we'll start with the uh, update on H39 and the VSP board motion. Uh, oh, there's speaking of Lou. <laughs> and he has to have his chair, so I have to apologize to him. I'm going get on the camera, I guess I am. We're sorry, Lou. Gio took your chair. We already chatted <laughs> for him, but you weren't here. I didn't know he was coming. Besides, he owes me. <laughs> no, well, that's not, not until 7.40. <laughs> 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 Are you going to stay over there? Yes. Okay, so that's a good side Let's go with yes. um, Nicole to start off. Okay. So, um, first off, I um, owe uh, Linda and the board an apology um, because you raised uh, a question in the last meeting about the wording of our mission statement and vision statement. And you, in fact, were quoting the correct version. I was quoting a version from our old pamphlet that has been incorporated into all of my documents for the last four years. Um, and was not, uh, so a change was made um, in the bylaws to strike local and supervisory boards and replace it with all boards. Um, so I did share that with the executive committee. Carrie called it to my attention as she was doing the minutes from the meeting. Like, I went back and looked at it and actually you didn't have that quite right. <laughs> so so um, they said that uh, bringing it up tonight was probably going to be sufficient, um, but I, I do apologize for, for having that wrong. Um, I'm always amazed at the four of you and what you get done. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and I will go back and, you know, all my executive director reports, everything, so I'll, I'll make sure I correct that moving forward. Um, but wanted to uh, start there. Um, after the last meeting, uh, next day, Neil testified uh, in the Senate Education Committee, and Floor uh, was there um, with me also in attendance. Um, Neil, did you have any, I didn't ask you to think about this, but did you have anything to share based on that? Experience with board. You all received the email with the link to the testimony, so you saw mm -hmm. what was shared. But yeah. um, um, no. it was aside from what happened after the testimony. The testimony itself was fairly uneventful. Um, you know, it was. We were the last, I think, out of twelve folks to testify that day, and I would say nine out of the twelve. My recollection was we were all. Um, in favor of delay. Um, there were two that um, were not, but they were not, I, my reflection was they were not school board members. One was Sonia Spaulding. Sorry, Barry, one was, and then the other was the superintendent. Barry. Yeah. Um, and uh, I got one question from the testimony, and that, uh, had I been more quick to think on my feet, that that question had nothing to do with the testimony that VSB offered that day. Uh, the question was whether or not my particular school district um, engaged in some sort of Act 46 discussion. Um, and uh, like I said, had I been thinking more quickly on my feet, I probably would have said, I'm not there today to represent my school district. I'm here today to represent VSBA, but um, maybe next time. <laughs> uh, and then, uh, unfortunately, I think things, things devolved after the testimony. Um, and there was someone there that was uh, present um, who was, I think, a bit argumentative, if not abusive, um, with Floor on the way out of the meeting, um, which was quite unfortunate. Um, she handled it amazingly well, um, but I think it was just a, a further sign of how divisive this whole issue has become. And, um, you know, the point that Nicole has made earlier in some of the comments here, the, the whole civility piece of things seems to have gone out the window in a lot of these discussions, which is extremely unfortunate, because I'm not sure that we really get anything done if all we do is spend time yelling at one another. So, um, 
most of you probably saw that what a lot of people latched onto was one statement that we made about um, some of these acts being considered civil disobedience, um, which, you know, I mean, I guess if you're going to pick out one thing from all that testimony and that's the thing that you took issue with, then you're probably missing the broader point that the VSBA was trying to make there. Um, so, but uh, we gave the testimony. And then Nicole gave it again in a somewhat um, modified format for past education after that. So, so after um, uh, the testimony um, uh, in the Senate Education Committee, a day or two later, they voted on their version of the bill. Um, it, it wound its way through the Appropriations um, Committee. It sort of, there, there wasn't a uh, fast pace in the Senate, which I think took a few of us by surprise. Um, but it did eventually pass the Senate uh, with a strong vote. Um, the floor debate, I think, is worth listening to. We have a, a copy of it, if you're interested. Um, a lot of uh, senators expressed strong support for Act 46. and and um, that this was a difficult vote for them. So um, any, in any event, it then went to the House Education Committee, um, or went back over to the House, where the question is, did they concur with the Senate's <coughs> version? Did they concur with further proposal of amendments, which means we kind of agree, we'll need to make some more changes, or did they um, ask for a committee of conference? And as the <coughs> committee was deciding um, to which path to take, they asked um, uh, for our association's testimony, the superintendent's association, and the agency of education. Um, a group of us were down at the NSBA conference and um, discussed how we should approach giving that testimony in the House Education Committee. Um, and again, I think uh, it's important that um, legislators understand that this is not um, Nicole Mace delivering a message, but it is the, this organization and the board members that make up this organization. So we came up with an idea to um, actually share some footage from this board meeting at the House Education Committee, uh, to the, with the House Education Committee. Um, and we um, were fortunate to have four of our board members sitting, happened to sit in a row, all of four of whom were, are affected by the state board's order uh, and voted with the board's motion. Um, so thank you to Mark, uh, Diane, um, Jean Marie, and Floor for agreeing to share their raw footage. <laughs> Perhaps not as polished as uh, maybe. Um, I think uh, Diane's uh, get her done comment uh, elicited some laughs in the, in the committee. But it was a really, uh, in 10 minutes, great way for them to hear from four board members who are actually in the systems that are being um, discussed and who also supported the majority position. Um, so I shared the document, essentially, that Neil had shared in the Senate Education Committee, played the video, and, um, and then then they voted or they decided uh, that day that they wanted to call a committee of conference. The <coughs> committee of conference has on the Senate side um, Senator Baruth, who's the chair of the committee from Chittenden County, Senator Parent from Franklin County, and Senator Perchlick from Washington County. And on the House side, it is Representative Conlin, who's the vice chair of the House Education Committee from Abson region. Um, uh, Representative Coopley from Rutland, and um, Representative Jim Batista from Essex. And they have met twice, um, um, and they are pretty far apart on um, the approach to be taken. Um, the word today was they realized that um, they're not going, it's unlikely that either side is going to agree to the other side's approach to um, delay. So there's um, effort happening to try and identify another way to do that. Um, you know, at one point there was rumblings that 
the bill would just die. Um, and default budgets would get put in somewhere else, and that would be all that would happen. Um, but the, I think the, the sense I'm getting today is that um, leadership would like there to be uh, something, uh, some compromise, uh, but I don't, I don't know what that is. Um, uh, so there's certainly not a huge amount of urgency being brought <laughs> to the work um, after they met yesterday and it was clear they were very far apart. They decided not to meet again and just have the two chairs of each side um, try to work something out, um, which is problematic because then that means we can't be in the room. We don't know what's being, what's being cooked up. Anybody else? Anybody have any questions? That's part of it. I do have a question. Um, so the two chairs of the Ed Committees? No, so the each two side has like a side. Yeah, so, so Peter and, and Bruce. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 And, um, I think something else happened that way. So a lot of things <laughs> <happen> that way. <laughs> no, it just like something is really fresh and that happened like at the end. I forget what it was. But I think the only other thing I just want to add um, as part of the update is, um, and other members of the executive committee can can weigh in. I think we did receive a few emails from members after the uh, communication um, went out about the board's motion. Um, some expressing concern about the um, position and you know one I believe in particular said that they were going to be bringing the question of the SBA membership back to their board um, we also received a number of communications thanking the board for um, you know taking a difficult position um, so uh, it's a, a mixed bag per, per usual um, but did want to make sure you were aware of that Okay, and, and, and these guys coordinated together to send responses to every person we heard from, so they did get a response. We're going around the table. Start this, Don, so I won't no. you no. this time. Fire, it's got a fever? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, okay, I just want to clear up one little thing, then I'll tell you why. So, after our meeting, did you testify at all, or were you out of town? Did you testify that? We decided that Neil would deliver okay. the testimony on behalf of the board. Right. I me, was in the room and so was Warren. Let me tell you why, because uh, two days after that, uh, I'm on the transition committee, mm -hmm. and one of our favorite people, former board member, came in, mm -hmm. and when the chair asked if there were any other comments, which I don't think we had to do, he said yes. He recommended to all of our boards that they not pay the VSBA dues based on your testimony mm -hmm. in the Senate that committee, or he right. said Senate. And uh, I just thought that was interesting. Uh, Nicole Mace's testimony? Yeah. yeah. Well, that didn't happen. Yeah. But well, that see, was that, dated. No, no, no. <laughs> but he did. Those were his talking points he, before he Neil testified. I believe I can see on tape, and he definitely said the executive director. Right. He has a hard time with the truth, in a way. But, uh, <laughs> anyway, but uh, no, I just was curious because, uh, so after he did his little song and dance, uh, I reminded people that I represented one of the Franklin County and that uh, his indication that other people had withdrawn and more were going to, that last year our report showed that everybody paid their dues, which I think was the truth. It might have been one and lingered, but I think everybody paid, but I said everybody paid. So based on that, I, I reminded him that maybe he should check his facts. Mm -hmm. So Wyndham Northeast has still not paid their dues, and even though they, they haven't taken official action not to, we're considering them no longer members. But that's the only group everyone else had. But I thought that was... You know, he just won't let it die. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Clarence. Yeah. I think we're right up to Gio. Yeah, I'm just curious, as, as, as a technique, how did it work? How do you think it works showing? The video? Yeah. Is that um, something we should think about again in the future? So you just want to make sure no. you all your speech. <laughs> 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 oh, my goodness. That was terrible. Yeah, I, I think it's, um, uh, I think it's, um, 
Brad James told me he thought it was very effective. <laughs> but um, I, you know, I uh, the sense I got was people were very um, engaged and, and listening and um, uh, appreciative of the different perspectives. Um, I think it was a little hard to hear at some points, but um, I didn't get a lot of comments afterwards. Uh, but I, my sense was that it went over well. Okay, who was next coming around this way? The only question I have is if they don't do anything at all, July 1st things happen. Correct. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. My question. I just, I, well, I had a question yeah. too, which is just clarification. You said leadership <coughs> wants to compromise. Are you talking about the governor? Are you talking about the leadership of the, of the Like the speaker and the president oh. pro tem of the okay. I'm Okay. I'm not sure that the governor has weighed in. At okay. This point. The agency has testified in the Senate Education Committee that they did not think delay was um, useful. They did not support delay. Um, their testimony in the House Education Committee before they called for a committee of conference was more technical in nature in terms of some of the issues they saw in how the Senate language work, doesn't work. And, but it wasn't uh, globally what their position was. So I'm not, I'm not sure what role the governor will play as this moves forward. Any other questions about 39? If not, we'll move on to the other one. Oh, I'm sorry. No, it's okay. I was just, um, you know, we always have negotiators, it seems like, at every step of the way. Does the Senate or House ever hire a negotiator to <laughs> say, you know what, maybe we could, if we had somebody here who was completely neutral, maybe we could find something of each. Yeah. To do, they never do that. No. Well, you, you and I have to be careful a little bit, and um, our, uh, yeah, Adrian, uh, because the vote in the Senate was uh, twenty-seven to three, and if you know, you know the three individuals that voted against it. They just happened to be from Rutland County. Yes. Uh, so. Uh, there's a lot of power down there. <laughs> <laughs> Not as much as it used to <laughs> I don't know what happened with Cheryl Wilkinson, too. You know, so you Cheryl? probably got to her, right? Oh, sure. Uh huh. Yeah, I, my feeling was that people was already there. decided prior to us even meeting and having that wonderful conversation what they were going to do. They had already made up their minds at that point in time. And that's the sadness to me is that you that you come in with your mind already made up, but you're not willing to hear something. Okay, we'll move on to the next item on the agenda. That's uh, other legislative issues. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you get the floor again, Bill. Um, so I'll start with the good news. <laughs> Um, it looks as though the House Education Committee is going to include uh, language that we have or, or recommended on SU board representation. Um, um, so all the, the effect of the, uh, first of all, maybe don't remember, um, the, um, uh, at the annual meeting, a resolution was approved asking for the General Assembly to review um, laws governing supervisory unions. Um, it was a pretty broad um, uh, resolution, um, but intended to address concerns around uh, in, in situations such as news and geos where, um, and maybe others of you. Linda's, thank you. Um, where you will, where there will continue to be a supervisory union, and some districts within the supervisory union merged, others did not, and the merged districts, um, in some instances, went from 12 representatives on the SU board down to three, and now they have the same number as um, a single district with a pretty small number of students. The, the way the current law is written, um, um, you have to have uh, the full SU board. Uh, vote to request a waiver from the um, statutory requirements of the state board. And in some places, like our friends in Taconic and Green and Bennington Rutland, they work it out and they have an arrangement that reflects more of a proportional um, situation. Same with you, um, Amy? Well, each town, we maintained our three representatives. So the town. Our, um, 
the the two town the two districts that merged we each have three so we're six and you got the state board to approve that you correct went to the state board yes uh -huh. we, only have, we only have four board members so we couldn't have three from each each town because there's only two from each town on the new board because with the the default articles of agreement which we ended up with there's only two per two per so we only have two schools merging right actually I guess there's six because we have the the high school merging too so but yeah we could barely have three from each town yeah we'd be the whole thing so um <laughs> so there's um a gap in the in the law in terms of if the full board does not agree there's really no path to the state board on its own to review the situation or for a member an aggrieved member district to um bring their case to the state board and so um the language that we uh, uh shared with the house education committee um, and that's being reviewed by the Legislative Council would allow in an instance where you have a supervisory union with a, um, a unified, at least one unified district, um, either the State Board on its own can, can review SU Board composition, the SU Board can request it, or a member district within the SU can request a review, um, and the State Board may take action to, I can't remember the exact language, to ensure um, representation reflects the relative number of students within each district. So um, we weren't sure what was going to happen with that language because it was um, kind of in the agency of education's um, uh, sort of package of changes that they're holding um, for uh, revisions to Title 16 to reflect the changing landscape we're in. That package does not seem like it's moving this year. and got some feedback from some of you on our board that waiting another year was not ideal. So I reached out to um, Representative Conlin on the committee who's very familiar with the issue and he agreed to um, essentially uh, sponsor the language in the bill. Um, I testified in that committee today and they seemed, there's a lot of questions about what is a supervisory union from some people that live in single districts that really don't understand. Um, but, uh, by and large, there didn't seem to be any concerns. Uh, of course, it, it's not in the Senate's version of the miscellaneous ed bill, so um, anything that gets added on the House side will is subject to negotiation between the bodies at the, at the end, so it's certainly not a guarantee, but um, we're at least uh, in the game, so to speak. Any questions about that? Uh, Dan was first, and then we'll go. Oh, I didn't have a question. Dan. Oh, Dan. I was sorry. just going to say, um, I'm sorry. Did not sit next to each other. <laughs> I could be more clear. Are my ears? I'm just going to clarify, Nicole. Um, my supervisory union reunion hasn't uh, union has not made this decision yet. We're going to next week. I think it's going to be pretty straightforward. I don't imagine any grief uh, grief parties or anything. Uh, are we going to be able to do it? Uh, just. Uh, based on our own decision or does it look like we might have to get SBOE or someone to review it? No, as long no. As it's all this does is create a path for people who don't like what, what their happening. fellow board members right. in the supervisory union have decided okay. that they can go to the state board. It doesn't change the, the status quo in terms of... We make a decision that's our decision and if everybody agrees then we're all set. Well, uh, no, so current law does require a state board uh, uh, approval uh, of changes. Okay. So that, that would not be affected by what we're right. requesting. Um, anything other than three reps per district that operates a school needs approval from the state board. Our issue is who gets to trigger the approval from the state board. Is it the whole SU has to agree or a single district that doesn't like the situation that's been decided upon by the majority can make an appeal to the state board for the state board to conduct a review. But the state board always has to approve variations from this, the, the default, which yeah. is three per district. Okay. Yeah. Hello, and then we'll go um, You said it's based on student count, or is it on census numbers? I will look that up. <laughs> Ours is based on population. <laughs> really? Wow. Cambridge has more people with the same number. <clears throat> And this is, again, la 
language that Donna Russo Savage uh, may, uh, may adjust the Supervisory Union Board representation required by Section 266 to more fairly and accurately reflect the relative number of students for which each member district is responsible and the grades for which the districts operate schools. Um, so, if you have suggestions in terms of changing that in order to reflect what you um, I believe I shared that language with you, Gio, yeah, um, who was responsible for the resolution. Um, I'm happy to share it with others who want to take a look at it. And it's still in play, so we can recommend. And, and, and as I said, Claire Ledge Council is reviewing it, so he may come back with something worded entirely different, but the, the concept will be the same. Are you right, Jim? Yeah, I was just, uh, but, you know, for, for Dan, when, since we went through the whole process, you know, we had the merger approved, and then we, but, but we actually, in our case, it, very specifically, we had the State Board of Education give us approval for the different, different setup, and we even presented that as, okay, we want the merger approval, but that's sort of contingent upon our getting the supervisory <laughs> union representation correct, so they specifically approved, but, you know, our view was we had to get the specific approval. Also, you know, in our negotiations, we ended up with one district that was well more than 50%. And so, you know, that was another issue of we ended up having to make it clear that that one district couldn't shove everything down everybody else's throat. So, you, you know, we had to come up with a mechanism for that. So just one thought is making it as open-ended for coming up with something that, that could be reasonable as possible is probably a good idea because you get some weird situations. Right, right. <laughs> Yeah, in, in, in our case, if you did it based on census, the Cal Coal board would have more, more than enough to pass every vote. Yeah, we ended up, our biggest district's like 70%. <coughs> yeah, so, you know, we had to say they can't, they can't make everybody do what they want. <laughs> How did, you, how did you do that? Yeah, I was wondering that myself. We ended up with a, with a mechanism that, you know, essentially gave them about 50% of the vote that said at least two districts need to, to give it approval to take an action. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Diane? Um, so we had done ours with our original articles way back when. Right. And they got state board approval. Right. So we, so we are a unified district plus the appendage district. Right. And we do not have just three from Huntington and three from us to make our SU decisions. Right. We have everybody on our board, and their votes actually are adjusted to be two thirds. So we 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 avoided that conundrum of having that equality right. when it shouldn't exist by doing it in the articles. Right. And they got approved. And, right. Um, Nobody's complained, so. That's right. And I, that's the, thank you for confirming that, Diane, because that question came up. Like, are we talking about Huntington here? I said, no, I, my understanding is in the mud context, that got dealt with as part of the articles. So they I'm did not, not object to it to make us create another board right. beyond that right. at that time. Right. So when the articles were passed, everybody on the MMUSD board is also a member, a voting member of the CESU um, board, governing board as we called it, mm -hmm. and all of the um, Huntington reps, which was one from, actually they only really have one just from their individual school district, and the other two on the town are also on the mud district, and they each have a two-thirds vote when it comes to making CESU governing decisions. Right. And the state board approved that? Correct. A two-thirds vote per person? Yep. Yep. Not necessarily this state board. But, but it also, ago. yeah, but it, it, what it did was it created um, proportionality amongst towns, which seemed more important at the time. Right. I think that was a bigger emphasis when you were making um, mergers at that time. Yeah, okay. Um, was there anybody else had their hand up? That I, I think the other, the other side of this coin is where it wasn't dealt with in the Articles of Agreement, mm -hmm. and it came up under just the old law, and it comes to the SU Board, and the SU Board says no, uh, which is what happened in our area. And so... Uh, we were young, though. 
<laughs> Stuck in your way. <laughs> but in all honesty, it reflects that we have a really good working relationship within our districts. Yeah. Regardless yeah. of what they're doing, there's no concern about what we do as an SU. There was just one concern, and that's what triggered it. The first year budget really was a problem, or was a very debatable situation, let's put it that way, <laughs> pleasantly. Okay. Like Anything else on that article? We have uh, any other people? Oh gosh! <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any other o'clock? Don't you worry. Uh, um, <laughs> other good news. Um, you know, it's a it's a it's a miniature step in the right direction. Um, so we were supporting um, H two o nine. Early worked with um, members of the House Education Committee and other interested parties in the development of a bill, including Martin Lillone. Um, I believe he was the lead sponsor of the bill, or one of them. Had a lot of sponsors uh, that would reinstate the or remove the moratorium on school on state aid for school construction. Um, the Institutions Committee shut that down pretty quick. Um, there's uh, no money in the capital bill, uh, according to them. The House. Alice. Alice Emmons. Um, <laughs> did not have uh, um, uh, interest in entertaining uh, reopening uh, state aid for school construction. Um, and, um, and the state treasurer has, in a couple of different contexts, um, uh, alerted the um, legislature that we're basically at bonding capacity. So, um, because the bond rating for the state was downgraded last year, that taking out more bonds, um, there was an affordable housing bond that was um, being discussed that has now been pulled. Um, so, the state treasurer has really, I think, thrown some cold water on any uh, expansion of um, the state's bonding uh, authority or capacity. <coughs> So um, that sort of left uh, members of the House Education Committee, who I believe really want to um, make some progress in this area, particularly given what they went through on the lead bill, which we'll get to. Um, their concern is that we'll, you know, we raised it along with um, many others. That, you know, for the state to now identify all these environmental hazards in schools and want immediate mitigation efforts to take place while it's at the same time, you know, paid no attention to the facility and capital needs of schools for the last 12 years is a bit uh, tough to swallow. So um, in any event, they are, and I, right before I came here uh, today, um, we're working on language that would create a school facilities working group. Um, and the purpose of that is to really um, establish an inventory of um, school uh, needs around the state. So before you can go into any kind of committee and talk about um, money, uh, it's helpful if you have a pretty clear picture of um, what the need is. And at this point, it's all been an anecdote. There's no position at the state agency paying attention to the state of school facilities. So um, that draft is in progress, but uh, I'm testifying tomorrow morning in support of this approach because I think it's probably the best we're going to get. Uh, and after 12 years of no, no acknowledgement of the uh, capital needs of schools, I think it's an important first step. Um, go ahead, of course. No, no, no. Oh. Uh, Nicole, is the agency weighed in? Not, not, officially. <laughs> not officially. But there there was some eye rolling today about the creation of another study committee. <laughs> but the agency has a staff. We're calling it a working group? Right. <laughs> 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 what are we doing when we run out of I had heard it one time and it wasn't this year, but I'd heard it one time a few years ago. The agency really wasn't that interested in uh, supporting any facility thing. Right. And so, you know, I think there's, um, um, I have to look at the language again more, more closely, um, but I think the H209, um, in one version or another, prioritized um, capital projects that involve the consolidation of schools. 
Um, we cautioned against that because there's a lot of facilities out there that are not going to be consolidating that still need capital um, investment. So um, I think there's some, there's going to be an opportunity for this group to number one, inventory the need, also potentially identify funding sources um, that are not the general fund. Um, so, uh, and the federal uh, Congress is, um, I believe it's the House, has passed a pretty substantial um, capital bill for schools. Um, and uh, so it's in the Senate. And so I think some of the discussion today was, wouldn't it be great if we um, set ourselves up to um, use federal funds for school construction because we have this inventory and we know um, where the greatest needs are. So the hope is that potentially there's some federal money that can be put on the table in the next year or two. Is the federal money typically a matching, matching funding thing? I don't know the, the structure of the bill that passed the, passed the House. Um, Clarence, is there anybody in the room who is in the like Springfield House budget. District? Is there anybody in, on our board here tonight who uh, is in the Springfield House District? Okay. No. Because it has been interesting times. Too. Emily Long used to room with Alice Evans. I'm not sure if she still does. <laughs> yeah. And Alice Nicka. She has the two Alices. Yeah. I think she's still rooming with uh, Nitka. Mm, yeah. But Nitka's not the issue. No, it's Alice Emmett, but she had, she was with both of them. Anyway. Yeah. Okay, go ahead, Laura. So I, I think it would be important to try to link that to the student outcomes, too, so mm -hmm. that we pass for our 46, because we tend to separate them as right. facilities, and you know, right. the built environment really affects you know, how kids learn and right. what we're trying to do for the 21st century learning, so trying to not separate those so that they can Right. Just take them out, so it's part of our goal to take for education, world class education it should all be cut together. Yes. And, yeah. And we have there's language in there that talks about um, yeah, student needs, modernization of facilities. Um, there's a lot of good language in there that I didn't come up with. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But it there's does. a lot of people that used to work when that was dying, you know, to roll architects that have for Yes. That have Yes, and there and would be the people, um, I think the working group will have uh, at least one architect on it uh, under the work which I saw today. Okay. Any questions about this other than what's already been laid out? I didn't hear anybody object to more capital money for schools. <laughs> well, there's I mean, they were wanted to be very clear today. We met with joint fiscal was at the table, and they said, we really can't signal that there's more money. <laughs> no. uh, so we're just going to assess what the needs are. Is that turnaround on that assessment likely to be in this session, or it's just establishing no, the group? No, this would establish the group. So, and, and just to be clear, they're talking about putting this into the miscellaneous ed bill, um, which was not language in the Senate version, so if it makes it through this body, then it still is subject to negotiation with the Senate. Good place to hide it. Yeah. Yeah. And my guess is after Act 46, they're probably going to be a little wary of doing anything quickly. <laughs> you know, because of that. Yeah. Just to clarify, that is H209, if we want to look up that language that you're talking about. Is that no, right? No, so H209 was the bill that we were hoping for, right. um, which is going nowhere. Right. And so there was some stuff in there about a, need, a capital needs assessment, um, but uh, the language that we're working on today is, is a little bit different. Oh, that, you'll, will you send it out when if it ever gets agreed? Yeah. To so right now it's still in thing. drafting mode. Yeah, right. um, uh, Jeff Francis um, actually, you know, basically sent an email to the committee this morning, laying it out, and Ledge Council took that email. Has been trying to put it into a, a form. And we met this afternoon with members of the committee and Joint Fiscal Office and their Ledge Council to just go through it. And, Clarify it. So that's what I'm. I, I'm hoping. I don't have it electronically. I'm hoping it'll be on the um, committee's website tomorrow. Um, 
and uh, as I said, I'm testifying more generally in, in terms of our support for taking this first step. Okay. Ready for the next one? I'm sure there's another no, one. No, there's another one. So, um, the lead bill. <laughs> Which we haven't really talked about it. So um, the Senate um, passed a bill um, that was, uh, as I said it in my testimony that was in your packet, is um, underfunded and unimplementable. So um, they would have required every school every public school, every independent school, and every child care facility in the state of Vermont to um, conduct uh, testing uh, of every uh, potential source of water that could be used for consumption um, in every building, um, doing two types of draws, the so first draw and then a flush draw, um, submitting their um, vials to the Department of Health, uh, for testing all to be concluded by December of this year, <laughs> leaving approximately 70 school days uh, because you have to do the you can't do the testing over the summer. You have to do it while the pipes are in use. Um, and the fiscal note um, that they came up with um, assumed that school districts have plumbers uh, on staff. To do all to the extent uh, uh, lead levels that were identified as being above the action level, that we just have this sort of fleet of people that can um, start replacing fixtures. Um, they also had language um, that did not um, guarantee any any um, particular level of reimbursement from the state for remediation. So all testing costs were paid for um, uh, through uh, essentially surplus revenue from last fiscal year for the Budget Adjustment Act for this fiscal year. I can't exactly. The Budget Adjustment Act is still being held up by the governor's office, so we don't even have the funds in hand um, for testing. Uh, but we had some concerns about, you know, schools basically assuming a tremendous amount of risk because the costs of remediation were largely unknown. I mean, as we said earlier, 12 years of no school construction aid, we've really got no idea what's behind the walls in our pipes and what's in our fixtures. So um, we uh, were unsuccessful. Oh, the other thing they did was um, establish an action level of three parts per billion which is the lowest in the country, um, is lower than the standard from the FDA for bottled water. Um, and uh, so then they had to include an amendment in their bill saying, um, you can still use bottled water. <laughs> if, so if you, have an action level, if you have an action level above three, um, and you can no longer use that um, fixture. Uh, you can use the bottle water. Right. Right. Or five, maybe. Right. maybe higher. Right. So there is a very strong, very organized advocacy um, uh, movement to get the lead out, and they want one part per billion. Uh, and so they compromised at three. Um, when the standard for municipal water systems is 15. So school districts are connected to municipal water systems. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a, it can't pass. So, um, raised a lot of concerns about that. Uh, the House, um, but, you know, they were on a mission. They were on a mission. You know, I mean, it's, it's really... Um, the folks from the Department of Environmental Conservation and the Department of Health did not raise red flags. We're not like, this is not based on scientific yeah. deals before, no. evidence of any sort. Of no, and in fact, there was a scientist, so I don't want to get into all the, <laughs> but um, it passed the Senate um, with a fair amount of fanfare and um, then went to the House Education Committee where then they, they started to sort of unpack the bill and um, um, and they heard from facilities, school facilities managers, um, 
uh, thanks again to uh, Jeff Francis, who, uh, you know, his network is connected with those folks and brought them in and said, you need to hear from these people, some of whom said, not only do we not have plumbers on staff, there are no plumbers in our community. And there are rules, uh, state rules, that require anyone who's making changes to a fixture and outlet that's connected to a municipal water supply needs to use a licensed plumber. So the notion that our custodians are going to be in there switching out fixtures, uh, again, puts us in a position where we're going to be not compliant with your own rules <laughs> or the agency's own rules. So um, they were very helpful in terms of, I think, illuminating how the cost estimates on the Senate side were too low um, and the, um, the timeline that was created was just fundamentally impossible given the, um, the, the lack of um, qualified people to do the work um, in the event the action level is exceeded. So the House Education Committee spent five weeks on this bill. Um, and eked it out of their committee on a 6-5 vote. Um, we signed on to a letter with eight other organizations, I think we, we sent an email out to the members about this, um, calling for full funding of the program, and um, were pretty effective, I think, in convincing many members of the House Education Committee that this program was was an unfunded mandate absent 100% funding and that it was really an equity issue um, to, uh, you know, the program it gets underway this coming school year, budgets are already done, so the notion that you would have um, schools that identify elevated lead levels but don't have any funds in their budget to, um, so they, they were not able to pass 100% funding, uh, that came down from the speaker's office move the bill, you're not going to have 100% funding. The best you can get is 70% funding. Um, but it doesn't say 70%, it's a flat dollar amount. So they have their, their estimates on what the cost of specific types of fixtures is going to be around the state, and they've, they've listed a flat dollar amount that schools will be eligible for. It's now in the House Human Services Committee, where they are, no doubt, evaluating the impact on um, child care facilities. Um, we're going to work very hard to ensure there was some interest in sort of watering down the requirements, so to speak, <laughs> um, allowing them a little bit of a longer time frame, incorporating it into their own licensing regimen because they do have to test for lead in these facilities, although they only have to test one fixture um, and it's every three years. Um, so one fixture is not the same as all fixtures. Um, so we're, we're, we're again, in particular because young children are the most vulnerable. To the extent there's concerns about lead in water, young children are most um, vulnerable to that. So we really need to hold everybody to the same standard. And we think it's a $3.9 million program. They've already come up with 2.7 or 2.5. Like, it's a million dollars. Um, just, and, you, just, and, it, just, and the program spans two fiscal years. So you can just say, we commit 100% funding for testing and remediation. Um, you've got most of the money in the Budget Adjustment Act. If you can't come up with a million dollars next year, we're really in trouble. Um, so, you know, it appears as though the advocacy is, is working to a degree, at least on the House side. So. Um, uh, Jeff and I were paid a visit by the head of the Joint Fiscal Office this afternoon. Like, you guys are really making my life difficult. So, I don't know. Steve's fine. Yeah. Like, what is your problem? Quite a million. <laughs> I'm like, it's a million dollars. Jim, you had your. That's my million yeah. dollars. <laughs> um, the question for you, Nicole. Yeah. The, um, I was having, I, we have a local representative who's on the House Ed Committee, and I was going back and forth rather vigorously. Yeah. And, and, she struggled um, hard on she, that vote. Yeah, well, she was getting a lot of grief from me. She got grief after her vote. Yeah. <laughs> but one of her big points, and I'm curious about, it, you know, has has the governor or the administration taken a position on this from the standpoint of funding? Um, a couple things are going on. Yeah, so they were trying to use the governor as That's cover what, for she why was using they had big to, time. Yeah. And another one of our reps was saying that a lot of baloney, basically. <laughs> well, I don't have to hold a baloney. I think um, 
so I think people are confused about what's happening with the governor. So I talked to folks in the governor's office, like, what is going on? Are you guys twisting arms? To, what are you mm -hmm. going to do, veto the lead bill if it's got 100% funding? That's crazy. You know, you're not right. going to do that. So um, what they are doing is refusing to sign the Budget Adjustment Act because that references S4. It says this money is for S40, which was a, a not a great drafting uh, mm -hmm. move because now the governor's office is afraid that the legislature could strike all S40 and replace it with tax and regulate marijuana market. I mean, who knows? Mm -hmm. you let your imagination run wild. Mm -hmm. So they're, they don't want to sign the Budget Adjustment Act which holds up the funding for the program. Okay. That's but, different from, well, they here. also expressed concern, sorry, that if you set a precedent for 100% capital funding in this area, you're creating that in other. No, but and we're talking about, this isn't a capital <laughs> bill, it's a public health bill. Public health bill. Because yeah. this, I, I'm just, you know, to, to quote from what, you know, the emails that were coming yeah. back to me. One, on the yeah. lead bill, just a reminder that Gardner Scott proposed that schools pay for most or all of this work. I can't find the article what it up. Then government, Governor Scott would probably veto the bill at 100% state funding. Where would that leave us? And I just, I just want to, you know, kind of be able to go back and say, basically, you're wrong. Well, I, you know, I'm not going to throw Kathleen under the bus because I think she really did struggle. I had a lot of conversations. With no, it's her about I've it. got a good relationship yeah, with her. Yeah, yeah. You know. I think um, I think it's highly unlikely that the governor would veto this right. bill. Okay. Um, but the bill. governor and the governor was proposing 15 parts per billion as the standard. So um, that would have had different cost implications. The lower the, action level, the, five, so yeah, the, the lower the action level, yeah, the lower the action level, the higher the remediation cost because you're going to likely identify more fixtures. So we'll see what what happens, but um, we've but got their attention. Geo. So Nicole, you don't you only talk about fixtures. Is anybody talking about pipes? Because yeah, let's, let's solder pipes. these pipes. It's not just a matter yes. of like changing out your faucet. Yeah. You've got to track that all the yes, way back. Yes, that's what the facilities managers were talking about. But they, 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 is, are, they are... That's they are, big bucks to bomb out well, the entire plumbing in your So building. the Department of Health ran a pilot, <laughs> and the pilot indicated that if you change out the fixtures, the problem goes away. Right? So they are basing this entire state that's program... Let's let solder those on pipes. It's not going to go away. Well. 20 years yeah. ago, that that's, what, that's what you use. That is why we keep saying... Yeah. You cannot put the burden of, put the risk, you know, and we even propose, like, how about we do a deductible program? School districts are on the hook for the first $1,000 of remediation costs. Up to $1,000, the state takes it from there. Uh, and But why aren't they willing to do that? Because they realize the, the full impact of this is unknown. So. I wonder what the lead situation was in 1860. Yeah, right, exactly. Some of these are cool buildings. Let's get filters. Are we still at the three parts per billion? Oh, so no, thank you. The House Education's bill um, had five parts per billion. Which still means every municipality, any that is on the water system. Right, so if your municipal water pipes that are bringing the water to your school have 10 parts per billion, <coughs> and then you are, that water is making its way through your system, yes, it's a problem. They can use the magic faucets. That take care of the filtration systems. Yeah. Yeah. That's filtration system. I guess that's what I'm asking. Like, what is their answer to that problem? So my understanding is those new water stations have filters in them mm -hmm. that um, may accomplish some of the remediation, um, and those are expensive. Yeah. Um, Not going to for that. But there's a lot of. Um, uh, anyway, it's there, there, yeah. there's a very you know deeper. Conservation Law Foundation and a couple other groups are uh, very mobilized. It just seems like that energy could be directed at the source of the water. Well, the League of Cities and Towns has signed on to our letter. <laughs> I bet. As I know, if, they, if the problem doesn't get solved in the schools, they're coming to the for the municipalities. Next. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else have a further question about this lead bill? Other than it's 
It just seems to me that one of our biggest friends on this are going to be municipalities. Mm -hmm. Because if you know anything about water systems, uh, I bet you you go back and some of the sources find out a lead solder and yeah. main delivery system. So yeah. if they say 15, there's no way to get around that. Yeah. I don't think there's a gadget in the world that's going to get They through. had a guy from Hartford, I think, a water guy, um, <laughs> who was a real breath of fresh air, um, talked to the committee, and he seemed to think he had recommendations in terms of what the um, first draw action level should be versus the flush draw action level. Um, um, and I don't know, I don't know that they exactly tracked his recommendations, but they did hear from him and they did incorporate some of it into the, into the bill. But, um, I just think the number of students attend schools in municipalities with water system yeah. that far exceeds those that don't have a right. nice water system. Right. And I think, um, to me, and I said it in my testimony, what's most egregious about this conversation is that it's creating this um, sense out there uh, that schools are somehow dangerous places for children. <laughs> when you've got kids living in houses that are way older than schools that may have lead paint. That, so. We did get language put in the House version that requires the school districts in their letter home to parents about the testing that's happening also say, by the way, the biggest source of lead may be in your own home, and the Department of Health is, is required to produce materials to go, to go home, home. Because you know, the last thing we want to do is start to convey out to families, your children aren't safe in our, um, in our care. <laughs> uh, Next bill. Next bill. Uh, okay, I got uh, one and a half, and then uh, Don had a question about dual enrollment, so we want to make sure we do that too. Act 173 delay. Um, the uh, working group or advisory group um, unanimously, with the exception of Dan French, who abstained from the vote, but called for a one year delay of Act 173. Rule making and the census block grant um, uh, transition. Um, we testified in the Senate Education Committee, um, who, who, when they initially heard about it, were not interested in delay. And after two or three of us testifying, they're now. It seems to, uh, they were asked. Uh, their ledge council was asked to draft delay language today, so I think they're ready to. To move forward with that, they're just waiting to hear from Dan French on Friday. That's so. The agency's that's position. Right that's a special ed funding bill. The agency's position has been um, that they can, they're ready to go. Which is <laughs> their their uh, um, CFO uh, just resigned. <laughs> so um, she was the person who was very involved in the development of Act 173. So that to me is another um, big area for concern. Generally, but certainly on Act 173. They still have two positions. For I did tell so. <laughs> yeah. 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 And at the NSBA conference, uh, I go to the, the school attorneys conference, um, I heard several things that caused some alarm bells to go off for me. Um, so I think, uh, in addition to the rules not being ready for prime time, um, we don't have a, a sufficient group of um, school law attorneys who specialize in special education unpacking uh, some of the issues here. And, um, so I'm, I'm actually trying to put something together. There's just not that many of them out there. But there's, there's some issues. OK, any question on 173? Yeah, I'm just curious. What about a, a supervisory union that's already got this all set up? I mean, we're going to be starting in on this in another couple of months mm -hmm. based on, on the fact that it was the law and we had to do it, I think actually it's going to work pretty well. But what does that say to us then? Um, so that says that um, you're not going to be able to move forward. We can't do the right. census model. I think because the agency's um, position has been they're not going to do two systems at once. Right, they all have, right. Everyone has to move at the same time. Um, I think the to the extent there are districts that participated in the DMG pilot, they are the ones yeah. that feel most ready to go. Yeah. And our position has been that this is really it's an equity issue, and there's a, there's just so many unanswered questions, and there's been so little leadership from the agency to help people understand what this law is. 
Um, and some really legitimate concerns being brought forward by Vermont Legal Aid and others that we just need to get it right because it's one of those things that if we if we rush it, um, you know, the stakes are really high for kiddos. Okay, well that's good to know. I'll, I'll be in touch with yeah. the and I know the superintendents. Um, they, they okay. did a survey of their members and you know <clears throat> got input from the the. The superintendents and the special ed directors did the same thing. I think the special ed directors are generally more interested in moving moving it, but they also recognize that not everybody's in the same position. So it's the kind of thing that if you could do it in waves, that might be nice. So the early adopters can go, and yeah. that would require the agency number one to have a CFO, uh, and number two have an ability to run parallel systems. Got it. Okay. Uh, you had I'm sorry, I'm one minute over. No, um, there's a student data privacy bill that we're uh, working to keep sane. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's another example of um, you know children's data and information is at risk of being shared all over the place. Uh, why we're calling it out in schools uh, when schools are already obligated to uh, abide by FERPA. Um, is maddening, um, but um, we've been talking with the Attorney General's office. They've got, they initially had really complicated language. They're now agreeing to pull it back into, we're going to look into this to see if it's an issue, um, um, which I've told them I don't think we need to even have that. You, you're free to look into it. You don't need to have a law telling you to look into it, um, but it seems like that language is probably going to make it through. Um, but there's, in, you know, Legislators now get interested in like, well, maybe we need to require every school to have as part of their purchase order process some disclaimer about student. I mean, like, it, it, things can spiral out of control. Um, but hopefully, we've got that that one under control. Uh, and then, Don, you wanted to ask yeah, a question about dual enrollment. Okay. So anyway, uh, back many, many, many years ago, a few of us sat around and had a great idea that uh, some people were already doing on their own. Uh, to get colleges to allow students to take courses uh, at no cost, so they have college credits. And uh, started in Lamoille County where I had worked, and then when I got in the legislature, we talked about with Susan Barlett and others, and uh, we moved it and got the information. Um, and it wasn't an easy sell, particularly in the Senate, because some of the senators felt that uh, their districts, like Bennington, for example, boarded Massachusetts in New York, more than that was a law college connection. But, got the language in, so it worked. Mm -hmm. And uh, unbeknown to me, apparently the agency feels they don't have the staffing. So now if you live in a school district that sends students, in my case, to New York State, uh, you cannot get the dual enrollment courses. So I had a constituent contact me <coughs> while I was still a senator. Uh, I told him I wasn't, but I liked the idea since I was involved in writing the language with Donna Russo Savage. Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, this is a very unfair equity, this is an equity issue. Mm -hmm. uh, it may be too late this year for us to do anything. I probably will work with you and get a resolution mm -hmm. before PSBA. Because be this person that called me said, I, have a, I had a grandchild that went to MVU, where I'm on the school board. They can take the courses, they get the credit, no charge. But if you go to CCS in Champlain, New York, you can't do it because the agency Basically, the answer I have been told, and I have not talked to these, is uh, they, it, it's too much work in the NIH staff to do it. Now, I don't know if that's true or that's just what people are interpreting. Yeah. But I do believe I'm right in saying that the agent is not supporting it, right? So uh, there was a bill, uh, uh, a Senate bill, um, that um, uh, Senators Campion and, and Sears brought yeah. because of I know Senator Perrin supports Stanford. that. Yeah. Um, um, that would essentially, the agency sort of all of a sudden said, we're not going to approve dual enrollment courses out of state. Um, and um, that's a new interpretation. Uh, Sue Zulowski board is very engaged. So um, they have not moved forward with that bill. I haven't, I haven't been, uh, I haven't, I have not, 
uh, weighed in because I don't believe we have sufficient direction. So I think a resolution. It doesn't appear as though anything's happening. You know, I would make a motion tonight, uh, but I don't know if it makes any difference at this time in the game that uh, we ask you know, if the people are on board to support equity for students on yeah. enrollment. Yeah. If not, a, a resolution or something because, I mean, I just can't imagine anybody in the agency of education being against students taking courses in another state yeah. if that's the way it was. I mean, well, I they, think they, part they, of the, I mean, it's complicated. It's, yes, it is yes, complicated. Is, Sue Siklowski knows this much better mm -hmm. than I do, but, you know, she's on my board, too. And uh, we we do have the same issue, and our kids have been told that the by you know that essentially the AOE will not approve funding for for their for their dual enrollment in New York State. So we we very much have the same issue, and we're you know it's with the Meadowie School District, and and uh, we we'd be all there with you to try to it's just support that, pushing it. And, and I don't take time now, but I'm, but I mean it just doesn't make any sense to me that a child can take and go ten miles east or west and either qualify or not qualify. And uh, the agency, I thought, was supposed to be pro-child. What, what our superintendent told me was essentially it's a it, it's an issue. They just don't think they have the staffing resources, et cetera, to support handling it administratively and all this stuff. And, I think, yeah. yeah and I think Which is a kind of a familiar. Concerns, but, uh, yeah, I think, I, yeah. I don't know. But anyway, I, I'm going to advocate for it. I also understand there may be a lawsuit. Uh, a student uh, maybe suing them down at Stanford. Yeah. Yeah, so they were up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think that would be yeah. great. I'd love to see the agency get sued for something that I feel was stupid. Deny yeah. yeah. a child the right to take um, courses. I just, if this is just a change in their process, how can they just change their process? Is there, is there nothing you can read the law. There is a, there, the language is unclear. So but they're interpreting the, the law. Past practice, or whatever legal. Thing you want to apply to that says it was previously implemented in this yes. way. And get a new lawyer, get a new year, opinion. Hey, it's, it's all Emily Simmons. I mean, the the, the <laughs> Meadowy School District has been, been doing this with Syracuse University for a while. Our, and, and all of a sudden it was, I'm sorry, we won't pay for it. Well, I think that the other issue I've, I've read some of the bill is. It was designed for Vermont colleges, right? No, not, not totally, because Dick Sears questioned it when we testified and it made sure the Ledge Council, as I say, I believe we were working with Donald Russell Savage, made sure because of Sears going to be holding it up in a center of appropriations mm -hmm. that they could go. I don't think it indicated New York and Massachusetts limited, no. but that was part of the discussion. If we go to New York and Massachusetts, will that uh, satisfy them? And uh, yeah. Kathy wasn't there, that was another yeah. attorney. Somebody who was a so it gets a little, but I think that you, you, getting the resolution, get something adopted, some basis that we have to to go on, uh, would probably make as much sense as anything. Now, are we are we ready for something? Uh, yes, I'm done. Good. Clarence, can I make an observation about something? I'll only take a second, but we spent 40 minutes talking about things that we share in common, that we all see eye to eye on. So I think we to try to let our other members know that we're doing a lot more than Act 46. <laughs> we, we have a lot more in common than we have uh, opposite each other. So. Yes. I think we were pretty much in agreement on that. I think. Can, I, can I ask for just a straw how many people would support a resolution if we put forth a resolution asking that, uh, yeah. All in favor of a, a resolution. Now they have to see what it brings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have to read it. That's okay. No. See, it doesn't affect you probably because probably all your students. No outright no, 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 opposition to, to a clear resolution. about your language. Yeah. 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 Are we in favor? Are we supporting a resolution? Are we supporting the concept? If you're a public school, which is not really So, just so people are clear, I was keeping my powder dry a little on the dual enrollment issue because there was another bill that was that we were strongly opposed to last year that would have allowed um, private pay students enrolled in private schools to have access to dual enrollment. Um, and so those are, it's difficult to, to engage on both topics in the same way. But how, do you, how do you find private pay 
So a parent who goes who oh, parent pay pay pays versus to their child to go to a religious person. school, rice or no. rice. Okay, but not burn burden or something. <laughs> no, unless it's a parent who's choosing to do it to pay on their own. Okay. But a publicly okay. tuitioned student okay. going to burn okay. burden, okay. Yep. they have that benefit. Right. That's all, that's current law. But there, what there was a bill to do would be to expand that benefit, a public education benefit to. Right. Well, that was part of the big debate when we did it in the beginning, and right. that got because killed right in the initial anyway. stages. It never went anywhere. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. We'll take a break for lunch. <laughs> Therefore, let's see. Visit with member boards, Susan. Right. So that, that's part of what I want to talk about. Um, if you recall, at last year's retreat in June, at, in the visit. <coughs> the hallowed halls of Visbet. Um, I presented a board development plan for the year, and you all seem to think it was a good idea. So I, I want to <laughs> share with you what's been going on, to the progress on all of that. And I'll start with the board visits, because I know there's been particular interest in them. So to date, I have completed six visits, the most recent being last night. Um, I have two more scheduled. The boards that I visited were, we, Nicole and I sort of chose geographically dispersed different kinds of boards, SUs, SBs, MUDs, um, and primarily districts that we haven't had too much contact with recently in, from VSBA. They haven't been calling us for services. We don't hear from them very often. Um, the list actually had been a little bit longer, but two of the boards that were on the list, where I was just going to go and observe, actually called and asked for services. So I visited them, but under different circumstances. And so what I've been doing, to, I think Mark's the only one whose board I have visited. Is that right? I think so. Yeah. Um, right from last, last night is in our district. Right, in your district, I know, but I was actually at his board. Um, so I asked for 10 minutes on the agenda. I have received everything from, no, we don't want you on our agenda, to a half an hour last night. So I had to tap dance a little bit, <laughs> uh, particularly because it was a carousel meeting and the individual meetings weren't born for 45 minutes after. So. <laughs> lovely opportunity to get to talk to board members um, and so each of these has been different but by and large the feedback has been pretty consistent that even the boards we don't hear from rely on our resources the board chair toolkit or the essentials toolkit the model policy manual uh, so they know we're there they know that we're out there and they appreciate what we're doing. And even the board that didn't want to put me on the agenda because they were afraid I was coming in with a sales pitch <laughs> um, and told me that was inappropriate. <laughs> Before the meeting started and also <coughs> after it ended, the chair did say to me how wonderful our resources are. So clearly it wasn't any kind of slight against the BSBA. So I sit through the whole meeting with my 10 minutes on the agenda. And, and the way I explain it to them is, we want to make sure that what we're choosing as topics for board development are what boards will really need and what boards are really talking about. And so I'm just there to observe. And that has been the basic tenet of what I've been doing. And you've become the springboard because I'm about at the end of May, I'm going to be doing, because I'm the rep down here, I'm going to be doing somewhat of a presentation on what we go through down here. Oh, excellent. Yeah, it's like I told our board initially, I said, Don, you go from the Memorial, you go from the memorial Board, which we all know each other, I said, all of a sudden I get introduced to the state of Vermont where I've been all my life, and it's like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, you know, it's, it's been a really great experience for me to be here, so... Excellent. Well, if you would like me to come back and be part of your audience, I'm always happy to do that. Yeah, I'll let Just you let know. me know. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. So are there any other questions or comments? I know there was a little bit of concern with the recent testimony that had been pretty aggressive and a little bit controversial. 
that we were going to be getting some pushback, and that has not been the case in the boards that I had already lined up. Okay. What's, the, what's the length of the average board meeting that you visit? You say you stay for a board meeting. Um, they range. That's a really good question. They range from 45 minutes to three hours. Ironically, um, the longer the meeting, the more often they meet. <laughs> so that, that to, to me speaks volumes about the, the nature of the work that the board is actually doing. Um, you know, the, the ones that are really efficient and thorough know their stuff, they know what the work is, they address it appropriately, and, and it's an hour or maybe an hour and a half once a month. Some of them are meeting two times a month, and those meetings tend to go longer, and they're the ones who are, you know, um, signing warrants in the meeting and questioning line items and um, hearing from every principal in the district <coughs> or in the SU. I've mostly gone to SU meetings. I, I want to start to issue guidance on principal reports, the role of the principal report in yeah. board meetings. Yeah. I mean, last night, last night was different because I broke out into the three different districts, and so I understand that's the legacy. But I actually, what was your meeting at the SU level where every principal spoke out on what was going on in their school? And, you know, it was the school plays and the athletic teams and, you know, the spirit days and school culture. All of that's important, obviously, and it's important for board members to know what's going on in the school, but not at that level. <clears throat> and so it, it, it got pretty difficult at some point, sometimes to just go through all of that. And I'm sure I wasn't the only one there who was finding it more information than I was able to absorb. I'm sure there were school board members there feeling the same would way. Would you be willing to, de I mean, would you be able to determine which districts follow the guidelines or the concept of policy governance versus those that don't? Um, we, we have some idea of that. But by sitting there, would you get a sense that these people have been I actually meeting? have not attended any policy governance board meetings. Montpelier Roxbury? Montpelier did. Well, that, that was the one I left because of a snowstorm. That's right. Um, and I actually have been in touch with them, and I, I need to go back there and see a whole meeting. Um, but it's they're not fully immersed in policy governance. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay, so this is a slide that I shared with you back in June. Um, <coughs> oops, and it's funky the way we're transmitting it here. But um, so these were the three goals that we had set out for board development for the next year to improve board performance through training, that's sort of the mother load, to increase participation in the board development offerings, and that last one says to expand board development. And I know Neil took exception with this, but the word I used was revenues. Oh, this is really bad. Okay, so, <laughs> well, it's all running off here. Uh, so things that are, this is also last June's slide. These were the things we laid out that we were going to do. A cohesive webinar program, expanded digital offerings, individual board development opportunities, <coughs> um, targeted board development, new board member boot camp <coughs> visitation so you have the oh, slides I do in, have, in your thank packet you. board visitation <laughs> on which I have just reported <coughs> thank you Nicole yes all of these slides are in your packets um, so I just want to report out briefly on each of those so our webinar series is once a month it's the first Thursday at six o'clock everybody knows that we have had people sign up for the entire year at once, and others sign up as we go along. Um, these are the numbers. So our registration numbers, if I add up since the, the resolutions, which we pre-recorded, it wasn't really in webinar format. So if I add that up, we had 460 people register. When pe people are told, I hope you all know this, I hope you read our email. <laughs> uh, when you register, that means you get the follow-up mailing, which includes the uh, link to the video, the slide deck from the PowerPoint, and any handouts that are either discussed during the course of the webinar or planned for distribution to accompany that webinar. So <coughs> people do sign up at 
and don't intend <coughs> to actually participate because they want to get those benefits. And then there are people like Dan who sign up for everything and then email me and say, I'm not going to be able to make it because we have an emergency board meeting. <laughs> uh, and I appreciate that. So our participation numbers are lower for the reasons I just mentioned, but our YouTube <coughs> hits kind of balance it out. So I'm pretty pleased with these numbers. Would I like them to be higher? Sure. Um, I recognize not every topic is relevant for every board member. And as we continue this, I'm going to pay attention to which of these are more popular. And, and so, for example, in the fall, well, so what's coming up, um, we're going to talk about board retreats and negotiations. And then during the summer, we'll get into a little bit more of the ethereal stuff, the SBA resolutions in September. And then we've been getting a lot of phone calls about bad behavior from board members. Board members calling up and board chairs calling and complaining and not sure what to do and how to handle it. So we're going to devote a webinar to that, which should be interesting. <laughs> well, um, Anne is going to key off of our new content in our your book. Yes, it is. Are you going to explain to everyone what executive session means in terms of what they say? We are. <laughs> Um, so, board development events to date, uh, in terms of uh, actual events, I did these as year-to-date numbers, so we've been to more boards by invitation than we had been last year at this time. Um, a lot more webinars, fewer workshops, we have scaled back, as you may recall, the Essentials workshop, which we usually did right around now, last year I was on the road a lot. Um, in seven different locations around the state, marketing that primarily to new board members. Um, we opted instead to replace that with our statewide event, which isn't happening until June 1st. We decided new board members need to go to a couple of meetings before they, need, before they figure out what they don't know. Um, we've done a lot more superintendent evaluations. Sue is not here to speak to that, but I'm sure Nicole will and the same number of vendor contracts for various services that we subcontracted out. Those would mostly be superintendent searches and or Val Gardner doing policy governance. Right. I would imagine. Yes. So, again, I, I don't know another word, Neil. You come up with another word, I'll be happy to replace the word. Keep going. Keep going. Okay. So, year to date, <coughs> We are well over um, both last year's actual numbers and this year's <coughs> excuse me, projected revenues. Obviously, the expenses are commensurate, but our year-to-date net is substantially above last year's and also above budget, and you can see those numbers down below. Um, so 562% <coughs> increase in the net from previous year, from prior year. That works for me. <laughs> I hope it works for you. Um, okay, so I, I apologize for this, um, and I direct you to the handouts. So the upcoming initiatives, we have the big event coming up on June 1st, and we're gearing up to start informing members about that more. It's a day-long intensive. It'll take place in Barry at the Steakhouse Restaurant. Um, and chosen there because it's centralized, it is a Saturday, and I know that's controversial, but there isn't a time that isn't controversial. <laughs> we have, thanks to Kerry, just published our new updated version of the Essentials Book. <coughs> there are copies out there for each of you if you haven't already <coughs> grabbed one. Um, it is, it has been updated to reflect new legal pieces and a fresher view on, on some of the essential work 
domains that we've been operating with right along. Also includes, excuse me, Susan. By um, all means. An excerpt from a book chapter that Susan and I oh, wrote yeah. together. Oh, my. On yeah. <laughs> uh, Vermont's education funding system. Right. Uh, that's been published as part of a I forgot uh, we haven't gotten 50 those state yet. survey of, uh, of uh, the education fund uh, system, mm -hmm. which was something I, like, I agreed to do. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then, then we and promptly then we forgot about it. The guy, you know, like just a reminder: the deadline's a week away. Luckily, Susan had written that script for the funding video, right. so we had a lot of good stuff already. But, uh, and I highly encourage all of you to ignore that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is going to be very deadly dense. dry. <laughs> so, so we'll we'll the the book book about how schools are funded all across the country. A professor in Kansas. Yes. Oh, wasn't even like a doctor of Jesus or anything. Pardon me? No, no it, it wasn't. like an actual book. <laughs> wow. Yeah, no, it's not his thesis. He, he um, subcontracted out every state and put them all together in a binding word. Well, and it's so funny, too, because last year I was like, well, I don't know if we should write about this because the whole funding system is about to change. Right. And then that never happened, so um, we were sort of left on the hook to... To write about it. Right. It also includes, um, as I mentioned, two pages of I, what I hope is going to be very useful content in, um, <coughs> content in terms of addressing board member conduct. So we have converted some of your board policy on addressing <coughs> um, ethical issues. I think some of you are on the table have called us um, pretty regularly over the last year, like, no, but what's the process? That I that I use, and so um, we've written that out for people to, to use in terms of being consistent and clear. Um, and done. and we actually also updated the code of ethics. We did update the code of ethics to also be consistent. With. So um, that's certainly a piece I'm telling board members, <laughs> and, and that's new this year. In addition to the great chapter that we were on. <laughs> sure. You're having trouble sleeping at night. <laughs> yeah, it, it would be good for insomnia. So, yes. Just to, uh, I, I assume you've read the, the rest of the book. Are no, I have not. <laughs> it, 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 it hasn't been published yet. Are there any states that are any more complicated than Vermont? I can't imagine, but it, we know. haven't received our, our com copies copy. yet because... Once we do, yeah, we'll, we'll bring them to the board. Yeah. 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 I'm, I'm happy, I'm Dan, I'm happy to lend you my copy and you can report <laughs> back on that. Thank okay. you. Great. Yeah, Gio will do a book report on that for the meeting with us. That's right. Um, and, and finally, well not finally, are we coming soon, we had hope for tonight, it's that imminent. I don't think I'll be um, we are, we've created a, um, a booklet that brings together all of the SBA services that we offer to our, our members. We have in the past had flyers and slip sheets and it's kind of gotten away from us. So we're going to put it all together in one book. So everything from essentials to superintendent evaluations and searches, policy governance, anything that we have under our board development umbrella will be in that one booklet, which we will send out as soon as it's ready, and then in subsequent years that will be our midwinter alternative to newsletter. So we send out three newsletters a year that will round out the schedule. It has the annual calendar of professional development as well. Thank you, Carrie. Yeah, so we're going to include that on a calendar year basis for the scheduled events. Okay. Um, we're also deep in the throes of email campaigns um, about re board retreat facilitation, and in fact, next month's webinar is also on board retreats. This joint superintendent board chair training, which I hope you're all planning to be at, is on May 15th. You will be getting a lot of, well, if you are a board, you know, actually all board members will be getting weekly emails reminding you about that event, the first of which arrived in the middle of this meeting mm -hmm. by <laughs> accident, if not completely thought, up, thought through that way. Mm -hmm. And also a similar, then after that event is closed for registrations, we'll pick up with the June 1st event with regular communication to board members. And in, in the packet, you have flyers that Carrie had worked up 
for each of these events. So there's a flyer for the webinars, and there's a flyer for the June 1st event, and there's a flyer for the joint training coming up. And we also have a postcard for, that will combine all three. It's at the printer now? It's at the mailing center. It's actually in the post office as of tonight. So. Okay, perfect. So you should be seeing that snail mail in <coughs> some <coughs> days. Yeah. I guess it must be it because it's not advancing anymore. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, I want to thank uh, Susan for really I think, taking the feedback that you all gave at the retreat last year and running with it. And um, I think we've seen a, a pretty substantial response um, from, from the members. I'm really looking forward to the June 1st event. We will be relying on you to help us market that in your region, so we'll, we'll give you a nudge, um, and we may want to set some competitive targets for the regions. I also yeah. to make it a little interesting <laughs> about that event. Please, uh, the don't bother. The regions that have the most registrants <laughs> per capita on a documents. census basis. <laughs> <laughs> um, but. Uh, about that event, in the past, the essentials have really been targeted. Those workshops have been targeted to new board members. There are boards around the state where the whole board come in support of the new members, but that's rare. Uh, this program, while leaning towards new board members, is really also going to be valuable for veterans, both in terms of new insights, approaching the materials in different ways, and hopefully also giving them an opportunity to you know share their experiences with the newer board members so it's going to have a, a different focus this year and the more that you all can do to help communicate that for people who hear essentials and say oh that's not me mm -hmm. um it's it really is going to be different this year mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. any question for susan about any of this other than a thank you for the job you're doing. Well, yeah. and I also need to call out Sue, who's been um, doing a, a tremendous amount of work, both keeping tabs on the circus that is the, the state house daily activities and um, doing a fair number of superintendent evaluations. She and I have both been taking those on. Uh, I think that service has been very well received. Um, and. Uh, um, some of you may have read about it in the paper this week, <laughs> if you were in the Two Rivers uh, region. But um, it's been a good process for us in terms of, um, I think, really reinforcing um, good uh, superintendent board relationships. And um, uh, I've been enjoying the work. That's the superintendent's value, which we have up there now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just want to say, in, in part, um, as part of what Susan said about the uh, contacting your board members that if you all have noticed you should have all received um, an update reminder that you're um, I, we keep a shared spreadsheet with you with that has the contacts for your board members and a few of you have let me know when you sent an email and some came back that's helpful to me because then I know where to find there's changes on a daily basis <laughs> so um, a lot of changes on a daily basis so anytime I that you get an email back or that you say oh no so-and-so is not on the board anymore let me know because I can make those adjustments. But I update those at least monthly, so um, you, you can always go back to that same spreadsheet and know that that's updated. Okay? Yeah, Carrie does a lot of work between post-town meeting day and roughly <laughs> now. Um, Carrie, did, did you want to say anything about the new board member numbers that you're seeing as, um, um, after elections? Yeah, we had um, 135. So far this year, um, now reporting back, I've gotten, I think I've gotten all of the new ones. Um, usually we have about 175, mm -hmm. so, you know, there's less boards now, so that, that that's probably why it's not a huge difference, but, um, uh, yeah. And have we sent stuff out, we send stuff out to new boards, we so they do. all get new, they, like a welcome to the right. VSBA. They all get it, um, as soon as I get their emails, which is the first thing I get, they get a welcome to VSBA email. Um, that links to all of the, the new board member um, toolkits and things like that. Um, and then we also send them in the mail um, 
uh, a letter with in, uh, like the flyer for the June for the June first um, essentials workshop. It's got um, three or four different things in it that are just welcoming them. Uh, we have a welcome uh, newsletter that's just for new board members. It's got articles in it that we've collected through the <coughs> years for new board members. Um, and it's got an excerpt of the Essentials book in case they're interested mm -hmm. in the Essentials book so so that they feel like they're um, welcomed in. And I get a lot of emails from people that get I either of those and say you know, really that they really appreciate being welcomed to school board. <laughs> yeah. And just to dovetail on that, last <coughs> week, the April webinar was Welcome to School Board Service for new, new board members. Okay. 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 <clears throat> on those spreadsheets, is there a way to know which ones are new? Yes, this time I did that. I put it's car, it's the last column says origin year, which means the year they got on the board. Okay. So any of those 2019 are going to be new board members. Awesome. And I put, I specifically did that um, this time around so that if you saw there were new board members that you wanted to send email to, you could. Any other questions? Yes. I was just realizing for ourselves. I'm not positive that we let you know when we had a new student board member because that happens outside of our regular elections. So. I'm reminding myself and saying it out loud in case it applies to anybody else that when they're set up with their email to let you know. Like, yeah. mm -hmm. The secretaries will do that when I do the board member updates too. Okay. So, okay. yeah, they're good yeah, with it. A lot of reaching out. Perfect. <coughs> <laughs> a lot of reaching out. <laughs> okay. Next up is a strategic <coughs> plan monitoring report. Well, well I'm I'm just gonna gonna I just going to do my. So, we're ahead of schedule. <coughs> well, that's done. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, update on the statewide health care insurance possible executive session. Uh, just before we start this, just as full disclosure for everybody, uh, we'll be talking about insurance stuff. It, some of it might be an executive session now, but most of the information has already been made public as they'll go over. Um, but I would just ask everyone's indulgence as we have a board member here that's also a school employee because it's two different districts and that she ought to be allowed to, as a member of the board, to stay with us. That's Diane, you know, unless I hear a, a, an objection, we'll just include her in every, in all the meeting. And any objection? Not. She knows how to handle executive session material. <laughs> Does it all the time. <clears throat> Therefore, go. Uh, <laughs> turn this off. Um, well, I don't know. I, I think um, we can provide a quick update, and then I, I, I do think, um, given the nature of this, the discussion, even though a lot has been made public, it's probably a good idea to not have it be um, recorded. Um, uh, does that sound right to you, Adrian? Tell us when, and we'll move into executive session. Okay. So. Um, um, email went out uh, to all the members today with a pretty broad um, update. Um, I think despite uh, our efforts at, at collaborating, and we did collaborate I think pretty well on the data collection effort, um, the, the launch of negotiations themselves um, have been challenged by a failure of the parties to come to agreement on ground rules. Um, and in particular, whether or not um, the union team can bring five additional members into the room, um, which is contrary to the language of the law, and it's not agreed to by our team. Um, and so uh, um, the first session was held on April 1st. Uh, Adrian is a member of the team, so I think when the camera's off, she can talk a little bit more about uh, the dynamics, and then they met again today, and I don't know um, what's transpired today. Um, but um, <clears throat> there was essentially uh, an exchange of proposals. Um, the two sides are very far apart in terms of the approach, um, the initial approach at least that was taken. Um, the union's proposal is to um, keep the status quo for all school employees um, for four years. Um, while studying um, a plan uh, that would incorporate some method of income sensitivity um, and bring everybody onto a single plan. My, there's more to it, but yeah. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, Sleeper Brothers. Right. And then the, um, the SBA teams, and the school board teams proposal um, takes a more standard approach in terms of um, premium share, um, differentiates between administrators and teachers versus support staff um, because the first agreement allows for that. The law contemplates the second agreement. Everybody's moving toward a common benefit. Um, we were, um, I think, at somewhat a disadvantage in putting together an initial proposal in that the data were not complete. So the, the, our side, I believe, erred on the side of being very conservative because we didn't understand exactly what the cost estimates were. And if you put something on the table that's more um, generous uh, and you don't have the costing uh, out completed, uh, then you're in real trouble. Um, so uh, <coughs> the proposals were exchanged. Um, I think there was some discussion, um, but the NEA refused to bargain without their alternates in the room. And so um, our side filed an unfair labor practice um, seeking guidance from the labor board about whether that's permissible. Um, it, it seems pretty straightforward to me that if the law says this is who's on the um, commission, unless both sides agree, that's who has to be there. But um, so we can get an update from Adrian sort of on that process. Um, the act of doing that um, uh, caused the, and who knows whether they would have done it with or without the unfair labor practice, but the, the union issued a pretty um, scathing press release that um, yesterday was making the rounds, um, not so much with the media, um, more with uh, teachers and teachers who are on school boards. Um, I think the, somehow it was making its way around the Act 46 group listserv. I got copied on a few things. so. Um, um, we have now set up a, an email address for the employer commissioners, um, which went out in that email today, so people don't have to email me with <laughs> their feedback. They can send it directly to their um, representatives on the commission. I think that's pretty much the state of information that's public. For so entertain a motion to move into executive session. For so moved. Second. By uh, Celeste, seconded by Linda. Uh, any question or discussion? Who should we take in? Is it okay to take the staff members in with us? I would think so. Okay. Because they are school employees, so they don't have an agenda here. So, is there any other discussion or question? Yeah. Uh, you're in the state house. Any is the state house? Are the legislators following this at all? I got a couple comments today. Mostly like. You guys are causing trouble, and the Senate <laughs> Education Committee it, you know, invited Jeff Bannon to take a seat and report on bargaining, like winking at me, you know, getting me all riled up. It was kind of a, a like, ha ha type thing. But I, I know people are going to, are starting to now, you know. I hope they do. Yeah. All right. right. Any other discussion on the motion to move to executive session? Not all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried, so declared. At uh, 741. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to scoot out, but thank you all. Scoot out? Yeah, scoot down the highway. Fly to Brattleboro? Fly to Brattleboro. <laughs> Doesn't he need permission to leave? Sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, once you're out of executive session, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> So see you, Dan. Thanks, folks. Annual business meeting. Uh, so Carrie um, has reminded me that um, we need to start thinking about our plan for remote participation of the annual business meeting in October. Oh, yay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> not sure. And uh, I thought Neil had a whole plan uh, in mind. Uh, no, so we canceled the contract with votes because they're, uh, they didn't provide their service uh, appropriately. So. Um, I, I think I really wanted to just, I mean, I'm assuming we're going to move 
forward with it again this year, but that's not. Uh, um, I didn't want to. I wouldn't want to move forward with that assumption without you having a few minutes. You to have talk another about. company in mind? Uh, no. Um, we had talked about some options. I think uh, last year when when we decided to cancel the contract. Um, but um, there's no requirement that you allow for remote participation. You just have the option to do it and um, adopt the policy, which you did. Um, we didn't have anybody participate remotely last year. Thank God. Um, Thank you. So, <laughs> right, which was a I good tried. thing. Um, and so I guess I, we're just looking for guidance from the board. Do you want us to look into options and come back to you with options um, in May or June? Sorry. Is there someone who can tell us whether or not it's feasible? I know that sounds like a really crazy question, but... Um, given where Lake Maury is and, um, you know, that you lose radio stations on the interstate, is it even feasible to do a live stream for remote participation from that location? Which there's tons of reasons why we use that location, but is, is there a way that we can figure that out? I mean, my son-in-law can tell me whether or not my internet provider is going to give me enough Speed so um, last, I can get him yeah, last year I think it was clear that we need a booster. Like yeah. they couldn't do it without. They couldn't run the live feed and run the software, um, the, the, voting the voting software. software. Um, so the live the first year we tried it as a pilot, the live stream kept getting interrupted every time people were voting. Um, last year they brought a booster. Uh, you know I don't know if that's the technical term, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> and so that was not an issue. The issue was the voting software totally failed. Uh, so it's, uh, it, I, I do not believe that we could do some, unless we purchased our own. You can purchase one through Vtel. You if, just get, get the Vtel router and, and buy that. that the service of Vtel at Lake Moore I think is really, really good. I think it's like 40 megabits per second. Okay. If they if yeah. they if they want us to look into it, we can look into it. Right. I, 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 think, I, I think it's possible to do. Yeah. I have no, some no, suggestions on ways to do it. Tower. Okay. It's a cell it's a cell router. It's part of their cell. The, the VTEL okay. cell network. I think it's gonna be So it, if if we could see some nodding heads, if you want us to look into it and come back to you with some options. I'm not a straw poll. I think right. yeah. it's better it. than nodding heads. Okay, straw poll. Yeah. Look, look into, into it. it. Look into 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 Hard to get there, you know. It's in about execution time and all no, no. that. No, no, no. Oh, yeah, in, the, in the future, that's oh. why we went to that. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So, all right, we will have. Yes. Yes, Don. Jelly said how much time is this going to take. I mean, I hear how everybody here is working hard, straight out, and I know you are. If this is going to take, you know, maybe a day to investigate, but well, this is going to take a lot of time. I think it's a waste of time. <laughs> or is there somebody <laughs> on the board or something with a great tech? Okay. Yeah, that's a nice fact, Jim. Neil, that's Neil. And I can, I have I technology back into it as well. So, yeah, I, I have ideas. I know how to. Perfectly capable of looking into it. It won't take anything any close to a day. I don't think. No. We'll come back to you with that in May. Okay, so let's moving on. All right, update up. Oh, yes. Update on the NSBA conference. Um, so, who would like to go first of the people that attended? 
You don't have a presentation? I thought you had a, a PowerPoint. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I got a PowerPoint. The slideshow. Right. <laughs> We're going to start with Gio first because he's going to speak and then we can all contradict him and then he doesn't do correctly. We'll move on and I'll wrap it up at the end just to make sure. I just, I just think everybody should be warned here. Because uh, Lou and I had a nice friendly bet about a biology question, and he's a biology guy, and he lost, and then refused to pay up the bet the way it should have been paid. So I just think people ought to be careful with this guy. Let's back up a second. That, that was my takeaway, Jim. <laughs> the National School Boards Association conference was held at the end of last month. This organization sent Clarence. Neil, Lou, Geo, and Floor to Philadelphia to represent this fine organization. Um, and, to, and several of them did a presentation on uh, Act 46, Lessons Learned. Um, and a good time was had, um, and some lessons were, were learned along the way. So now, with that as a little context. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought our presentation went well. It wasn't a massive crowd in the room, but I, I think... Uh, more of them than that? you? No, there was more of us, by far. No, 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 no. no. We thought we were going to get four people. And crowd? And no, it said there's there. more of them. Oh. Than us. I thought that's what I said. So we don't have to say that. Maybe I'll explain why. It was at 8 o'clock on Sunday morning. It was at 8.30, actually. It was at 8.30 in the morning? Yeah, 8.30 in the morning. Yeah, it was at 8 30 in the morning. Yeah, 8.30 in the morning. I think, it, I, think, I think people were a little confused <laughs> because they kept asking the same questions because I think they kept saying, you were, you were doing what in Vermont with your government structure? And we'd say the same thing. And they go, that doesn't make any sense. You go, yeah. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> it makes no sense, but that's what we were doing. So that, that it made, was, no, made no sense because they're already used to a consultation. You had structure. a different school board for K yeah. through sixth grade, and then a different school board for seventh <laughs> and eighth grade, and then a different school board for ninth and twelfth grade. What's wrong with you? Huh? Huh? And you had, you had a what? <laughs> I mean, it's they had trouble understanding that. that. I don't and know why. Yeah. And you had a supervisory head with fifteen different boards. Yeah. 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 Forty so that was the question. So <laughs> 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 if only we could talk to talk to all the people that want to. Yeah. Bring pitchforks to my you, you, yeah. have, you, have, you have a separate board that governs 16 kids? <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. Does that mean you have a school? You have a high school that graduates yeah. three or four students? So yeah. Oh, that one got them yeah. too. Yeah. Yeah. So in total, you have, you have 39 school board members representing how many kids? Yeah. Uh, like 750? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's kind of how it went. Oh, and that was kind of, I mean, I didn't participate in that presentation. But there were people asking questions throughout the various sessions about the presentation you guys were, had, were presenting, and they were just absolutely dumbfounded <laughs> that we have school school boards that serve 15 kids, yeah. and we have every town has in most cases at least one board, if not two, mm -hmm. that they deal with, and. and yeah, I mean, a lot of the school districts that were represented there have more 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 students than we have in our state. Right? Yeah. So it was kind mm -hmm. of kind of eye opening. The, the the other thing that was kind of refreshing is they're struggling with the same issues we are, mm -hmm. even though we have school boards with representing sixteen kids and they have them representing sixty thousand kids. It's the same issues everywhere. Um, and I'm sure they all thought that. They all, their state does it best, and their kids are the best. Yeah, I think everybody was, at least, the, we're, we're learning from each other mm -hmm. and, and <laughs> hoping that the next person next to them had the answer. Sometimes but, people think that the recipe for our success is in the school board. You, you know, Diane, I'm just I've, I've gone to this for five years, and I, I don't, you don't get that. You right. really don't. It's more of a, what, what do you do? This is what we do. Yeah. And, and, that you know, the, it's more of that kind of exchange, and it's not, it's less of uh, we've got all the answers because I, I don't think anybody's got all the answers. Mm 
Yeah. Does anybody want to move to Vermont to be on a school board? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 She has spent a fair bit of time recruiting for superintendent. <laughs> <laughs> Unsuccessful, I don't know why. It was 12 o'clock midnight at the bar. Have you heard how we covered How we for the important years? Here go. Um, so briefly, I will, I will back up two days to Thursday, which was the day of the delegate assembly. So the day that all of the school boards from across the United States vote on what the changes to the bylaws are going to be, the changes for policies and resolutions, which then, just like the VSBA, then become the, the guiding uh, principles for advocacy for the NSBA going forward. There was a lot of stuff to go through this year. I'm not going to go through all of it. There was a change in the due structure. Um, that will have an impact on Vermont. Um, basically what it means is we will not see a huge decrease in any dues going forward. Things are going to be capped at what they were at the 2018 level as the floor. Um, there were some changes in, uh, so uh, for the past president to continue to serve on the NSBA, they now must be a member of a local board in their state. Previously that was not required. Um, I believe why this might be a big issue for the, B the NSBA going forward in the next year is that the president, the outgoing president, Mr. Pugh, is, I believe, no longer sitting on a board in the state of California, so he will not be able to serve as the immediate past president of the NSBA going <laughs> forward. Um, there were some other changes. Uh, it is now codified, I believe, in policy um, that the vice president will automatically become the next NSBA president. Not that that represents a huge change from what was happening in practice, <laughs> uh, but now they've just actually codified that. Um, I did take notes on all of the resolutions and bylaws changes that were passed. I could send that to Carrie if anybody was interested in seeing that. Um, it's a really engaging read. But if you want to know, if you want to know what the NSBA's position is going to be on items going forward, is that on our website too, basically? Uh, the results of the voting are not on the NSBA website yet. I don't know if they'll be up to that. That way, if somebody was interested. In that. Neil, do they have term limits for the president? Is it president? One year. One year. One and done. One and done, there is a whole line of folks that are all in marching like just ants going to the next position. <laughs> so I, you, you could figure out who the NSBA president will be 10 years from now, just like looking at the, the chain of people that just get marched through. I will say uh, it was a very important day for South Carolina. So the, the new president that was elected um, had swag available at her party. Um, uh, which was a, a catered event with an open bar, dancing, DJ. Um, it was a big deal. Wait, we paid, we paid for it with the news? So I no. don't believe that that is... So South Carolina may have paid for it. <laughs> Vermont, took, uh, Vermont got. You know, we tried to get our fare, and we got. We tried to get our our money's worth out of that. Oh, and I will say that the the big controversy apparently was not apparently was um, some states uh, questioning the value that they get for their NSBA dues, um, in particular because it came to light that the last year's president received forty thousand dollars from the NSBA for being president. Um, and also, I believe the executive committee made a visit out to his home district at some point during the year, and people were questioning, so how is that of value to me in my state? No. Um, they had to have an emergency meeting of the executive yes. directors and presidents the morning of the delegate assembly, 7.30 a.m., Clarence and I were there, yeah. and um, it was a fact, it was fa as, as an organization that's just gone through a news structure change, um, there was a lot of energy in that room <laughs> about uh, what value people were getting out of membership, and I was feeling pretty good about the process that we <laughs> used for our <laughs> <laughs> so, The new president said, I hear you. Yeah. <laughs> and we're going, to be, we're going to be working so, on it. <laughs> <laughs> Congress and yes. Okay. And how is that? Could you explain the relationship? 
Do they talk to Betsy DeVos? Or, or do they talk to the Department of Education? And who yeah, talks I think, to uh, I think it's, it's just a, a, the same. What, what we do here okay. in our little state is just replicated at the national level. Yeah. They have a whole advocacy team. I was going to say it's a little bit. Uh, yeah, sorry. The organization is a bit big. Yeah. Yeah. We have updated emails all the, the time on that. that you uh, may... Their policies on what's going on. Yeah, you do. We get. They could be forwarded. We have an email that this is what's going on. This is who they met with. This is what they're. You need to be advocating for right now. Are they the, so the resolutions that you guys passed? in the NSBA then are taken just like our resolutions are taken yeah. forward and then how do you, you say you get an email to find out well does throughout the year the advocacy from national they get, I'm sure all the officers get it, get it. Okay. I, I get I a lot of stuff from NSBA yeah. so yeah. all right I don't know. You go all the way to them. It's there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I kind of look at the filings. Right? And, and say, I do read some of them. I, no, I mean, the legislature. Yeah. Oh, I, yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay, thank it, you. It depends. It depends on the issue. There are also, uh, so I, I think what was really interesting for me is just the end. It's refreshing and exciting was to see so many people, you know, over 7,000 people, like, really involved in mm -hmm. understanding of the importance of being a board member of democracy. I was a little jealous that people went around collecting credits for learning and that we don't do that in Vermont. Like, it's something that could really change our culture and that we come to appreciate it now that we find, in my board especially, you know, like, what that would do to change our culture. So that was really awesome. Then the, the presentation by the kids, that we got to see this Maria Chibian that Gio had talked about. That was just, like, Pretty awesome. Awesome. Wasn't it? awesome. And then, you know, it also showed the, the importance of immigration. It, like, it showed a different sense of culture. And then the chorus, I forget where they were from, but they were really nice. And, and a lot of the, I think the two main speakers were really great. There was one thing that we were all a little bit worried about, uh, somebody talking about security and sort of monitoring internet, mm -hmm. you know, like, uh, that part was weird, but the <laughs> other, other than that, the two speakers were really set on, on skills, you know, and the gap of skills that we have in the United States right now. And that was really interesting. And, you know, I took notes, happy to share those notes. But, you know. And then we, it, it, was, it was great to get to know, you know, our members and see more, too. And it's fun to keep Clarence from getting in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Keeps me out of trouble most of the time. Yeah. We, uh, um, Clarence had hummus. Yeah. <laughs> 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 oh, yeah. The so so yeah. 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 And then we, and then we went to some off the wall place that Geo knew about where I could get a good hamburger and oh, okay. that, yeah. that, was, yeah. that was excellent. Right. Uh, and Fine. I yeah, made the mistake of ordering a normal yeah. bottled beer and they, oh, oh, oh we brew our own here, yeah. you know. <laughs> so, God, but, I almost had it. <laughs> that was, um, that was, it was, but the, uh, I enjoyed the, the <laughs> main speakers, of Sir Kenneth, Oh, oh, yeah. so, uh, he was very good. He was there. I I don't have it with me. I loaned it out. I bought a copy of his new book that's that's out, uh, and I will have it if anybody would like to read it in the future. I'll bring it around. Uh, it's uh, that was very enjoyable. The delegate assembly was uh, really gotten into the this listening session that they had early. The, that was something, I guess, this is the first time I'd ever been there, but that got people fired up in a hurry. The, the whole national board was standing there at attention, uh, trying to listen because it was kind of a, uh, somebody said, there's going to be a mutiny here, basically. Uh, you know, you folks need to start listening. Mm -hmm. so, and and they, they are, so I think that was good for the organization, you know, that there, there's some things, uh, they have this policy, the national president, they have one of the executives, one of the board meetings, their quarterly meetings, one of them is held in the president's home district. Well, that's fine. Well, then the president's from California and everybody had to go to California. And 
the price year over year is an extra 40,000 bucks. Somebody said that doesn't help members. They were excited about that. And Alabama comes in and says, we don't want these dues to go up. And we built a brand new building in Alabama. And you know, guess what? We rent out the parking lot, so it didn't, doesn't cost our membership anything to have that thing. The National ought to think like we do. Uh, that was, uh, Nicole Marvel really might have something that she wants to add. She was there too, getting her credits as a lawyer. She, she helped entertain us. She picked out the restaurants. And we had this beautiful Italian restaurant, great food on the second floor in the corner. I built my restaurants. But we made it. We made it. I didn't drink too much wine, so I made it back down the stairs in one piece. Some of our friends from New Hampshire were worried about it, but we got over it. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, one thing, that. the one thing I will say is if folks want to go on, there's an app that you can download yeah. for your phone and you can look at the, the agenda and the different sessions that were there and I think it's available to everyone because I downloaded it at the site so I don't know but you can get most of the handouts and see the materials that were presented at all of the sessions mm -hmm. not just the ones that you were at so there's, there's a ton of resources there. Right. And most of the presenters gave their contact information. And so there was tons of, of workshops going on all the time. And you could not, you just couldn't cover all of them. You got to pick between four or five that you would think might be interesting. Of the, I don't know, 40 going on at a time probably? I'd have to count been, them. Must have been 40 in every every time an hour block. and a half block. Wow. Yeah. Was, there, was there any trend that was surprising? Like, a, like any discussion topics or anything that... that, that Cut you by cut you off guard. That's something that's uh, that was. Anything I saw was it was all over. A lot of equity. Um, school safety. School yeah, safety. school safety. In school safety, were they talking about curbing it or doing more? There were vendors for school safety. Yeah, yeah. making schools more safe. safe. Blocks. Harder. I was able to go to a session on Blocks. dealing with. Difficult no kidding. board members? Yeah. Okay. And I did go to another session that was dealing with disgruntled public members of the public. Oh, good. And they were yeah. different people and very different approaches. So um, it, was, it was pretty broad what, what sessions were there. Yeah. Well, we're, we've uh, ventured on here pretty long, so we have uh, the consent agenda for the March minutes. So moved. So moved. The consent agenda by Geo, seconded by Amy. Uh, any discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carried, so declared. Uh, we have any new business that uh, need to come before us tonight? If not, um, any pressing issue for the agenda for next time? I just want to remind folks that your June meeting is the retreat to the board. Um, it's going to be at Visbit again this um, this year, and it's typically like a nine to three daytime. Um, we'll be sending out more details, but just um, where is this? Uh, for so it's just for the yeah. So oh, it'll be June. Yeah, 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 okay. okay. We'll June give you 12, this street address too. Um, which is a Wednesday, um, and we do not meet in July, um, just so you can plan ahead and. Um, oh yes, I'll be getting with the executive committee. We'll be planning this. Um, by the end of May, we have to uh, evaluate the uh, superintendent. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Executive director, everybody will get a um, a form that they can mail back to me or turn in at the uh, um, May meeting. Isn't it Survey Monkey? That was Survey Monkey. Sorry. Isn't it Survey Monkey? We do that. In? No. No. Okay. Turn in. Turn in to, at the May meeting. We'll have a place to collect them, and then we're, because we've got to go over it, and we've got to do the evaluation, and we have to have it done by the 1st of June. So it has to be done in May, so if you get it in between time, please fill it out and return it, or if you don't return it, fill it out and bring it with you at the next meeting. You got it. All right. Aye, aye. If there's anything else we've forgotten. 
Turn yes. in your mileage thing? Yeah, look, put, pass your mileage things to the end of the table along with the name. Thank you. Just so makes things easier. This right, end, guys. Yeah. Who would like to move to adjourn? I move to adjourn. I second. Motion by Linda, seconded by Celeste. Thank you. All those in favor say aye. 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 aye.